uh, TikTok, uh, Twitter, and all the folks, uh, feel free to share our show with your uh, friends and your neighbors because today we are dealing with some important issues as always. Uh, today, we, as, as always, we have some of the top lawyers in the country uh, that will be participating in our show. Uh, starting off with uh, John Sweeney, is one of the top trial lawyers in, in the country who has exposed corruption in mass proportion in LA Sheriff Department. Benita Banks, a past president of the National Bar Association, a superstar lawyer in her own right, and Milton Grimes, who represented uh, Rodney King. But before we get started with my superstar all-star panel, I'd like to bring up a couple things because as you are aware, many of you send me texts and emails and respond. This is the most reliable legal talk show ever. We are giving you accurate information. Uh, we tell you the truth and we research our topics and we move forward with important issues. Legal Issue of the Day is an important uh, forum to share ideas to make sure you're kept up to date on relevant events. One of the things that uh, been in the news this week, of course, is the start of disinformation. This information is an attempt to drive down voter participation in our upcoming election. Uh, we now find out that the Russians are now involved. They're trying to help a, the current president. Uh, the current president himself suggested that he might try to postpone the election. Uh, that, that he's worried about mail-in ballots and all this crazy stuff. And this is a process designed to keep you from voting. When you see this false information, the Russians, remember last time, put out an email or post that Hillary Clinton had somebody hostage, all this crazy stuff you're going to be seeing from September to Election Day. Don't believe it. It's going to be a bunch of false narratives sent out by the Russians and people trying to help the Trump administration. And it is stone crazy. One of the things that disturbed me this week, though, was a press conference that our president gave uh, that he said that by executive order, he's going to uh, uh, guarantee that everybody is insured for a pre existing condition. Uh, it was an ultimate slap in the face in view of the fact that this president had vowed to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, the so called Obamacare, that specifically provides for that type of coverage. It was insulting that at the same time they filed a lawsuit to get rid of pre-existing condition, that he will make a public announcement to say, to say that I'm going to issue an executive order to ensure that you have guaranteed access to help. Folks, if that doesn't, is that not a stunner? But I guess nothing is a stunner anymore. Now, the other issue is um, we're, going to, we're looking for an October surprise from the present personal lawyer, Bill Barr, who used to hold the position of attorney general. Uh, everybody predicting that he's going to come up with some false narrative right before the election. Remember, Hillary Clinton was leading the polls up until Jim Comey, infamous uh, email fiasco, where he said that potentially she'd been investigated for a crime for some emails. Of course, it was a nothing burger. She was completely exonerated. And, uh, but it changed the focus of the election. The metric became lock her up, lock her up, and it carried uh, Trump to victory in Electoral College, although he lost by three and a half million votes in the popular vote. In any event, that's the uh, background. And I want to make sure that uh, early voting is going to start real soon. Make sure you request your ballot this week, the early vote. Make sure you get your friends and neighbors. And do us one more favor. Do one favor. Call 10 people, 10 folks, your neighbors, your friends, uh, your homies, and tell them to get out and vote. Thank you. Now. Our legal topic today, we're still dealing with this issue of police misconduct. And I recognize that we get probably use of these responses. And um, even the folks in Mississippi who sent me the hate type, I appreciate that you listen to our show uh, because it's important that you get accurate information. Uh, if you pay attention to what our experts are saying and you do your research, what you'll find out, what we're saying, is 100% accurate. So the stuff that you've been reading about, hearing about, is fundamentally untrue. So I can't address each and every one of your, your emails that you send to our web page, but I want you to know in, in general, we'll try to discuss a few of those issues during the course of this, the show. Okay, racial profiling. Uh, starting off with uh, Attorney Sweeney, uh, 
you know, we see these news stories every day. Recently, we saw the incident in Colorado. Uh, it was a sad situation. Uh, a mother and some young kids and teenagers, they was held at gunpoint, put on the ground because allegedly uh, what occurred is that uh, they had a report of a stolen car. Actually, the plate belonged to a motorcycle guy. And I've seen those reports and they identified a vehicle uh, that is stolen. So it wouldn't just be a license plate, it would say a 2018 motorcycle. And I was trying to figure out how in the world that we get to the point whereby we start drawing guns on little children. Attorney Sweeney. Yeah, uh, I saw that incident. I saw that, <clears throat> that film, it was very disturbing to me, especially the little girl. She was a toddler. She could have been over three or four years old, uh, two or three years old. It was uh, very, very disturbing. But this all goes back. Get you guys right back on. You're, you guys are right now. Racism, systemic racism, uh, devaluing of African American lives. That's what it all goes back to. And, it, and we're caught up in a wave of uh, of racism that's been popularized by this president. Um, it, it's 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 a horrible situation. Police. Uh, uh, racial profiling is up. Police brutality is up. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible situation. <clears throat> and uh, it just underscores uh, that the problem is not necessarily profiling, and that's just a symptom. The underlying problem is the hatred for Black people. And it, it, it's been like that in this country since we stepped foot on these shores. That's what we need to address. I thought we had it a little under control when President Obama was uh, leading our country for eight uh, years, but it has come back with great force and vigor. It's almost like when you uh, prune a plant uh, uh, in the spring, it's gonna come back twice as big. It seems like that's what has happened uh, in our country. It's a horrible situation, a very disturbing those pictures from Colorado. Attorney Banks, you had a chance to do some investigation. What are your thoughts on this issue? Well, after our session last week, I was horrified, uh, outraged, and heartbroken to hear about the Aurora, Colorado situation. And this is um, a family out on an outing with um, the mother of a six-year-old and her nieces and sisters ages 6, 12, 14, and 17. And because of a, a grossly negligent, um, at best, mistake, they are approached at, at gunpoint and made to get out of, of their vehicle. And three, or at least two of the uh, young people were handcuffed and made to lie face down on the ground with the six-year-old and, and the other uh, children screaming and crying. And the little girl has a pink crown on her head. You know, this um, is devastating to those, those children. And it is a uh, symbol and symptom of the racism that exists in our nation. The newly appointed uh, chief of police, uh, Vanessa Williams Wilson, stated that there is, quote, uh, implicit bias in uh, her uh, police department and across the nation. From my perspective, it's not implicit. It's awfully explicit and um, and unacceptable. And as I looked at Aurora, Colorado, and just looked at Co Colorado in, in general, in terms of, of statistics, I ran across a 2015 study that showed that 37% of unarmed uh, people killed by police in 2015, now that's five years ago, were black. And that's three times higher than the nation's black population, which is roughly about 13%. And then from 
2014 to 2019, Colorado law enforcement officers shot 309 people, and 189 of those shootings were fatal, and all but two were deemed to be justified. And so far in 2020, uh, officers have shot and killed 12 people, and that's the fifth highest in the nation, according to a, a January 2020 report. Uh, and that's rate, that is the fifth highest rate of fatal law enforcement shootings based on uh, their population, which is roughly about 380,000 uh, people. There is a problem in Colorado. There's a problem in Aurora, Colorado. And this is a, a problem across our nation. And I agree with Attorney Sweeney and his comments regarding this is bigger than racial profiling, although this is a symptom. This goes back to 401 years ago when enslaved people were first brought over to this nation in the transatlantic uh, slave trade. It is uh, we've seen this with the slave patrols that we've talked about, and, and, and it's unacceptable. We need to address it. You know, Attorney uh, Lee, I'm always focused on uh, the law, and I, I do believe that uh, racial profiling should be prohibited by law uh, pursuant to the bill that's been introduced the in racial profiling and uh, religious profiling, and it sets out uh, specific um, actions that should be taken now to to stop this um, example of systemic racism in our nation. Attorney, okay, Attorney Grimes, I bet when you saw that thing in Aurora, what you it brought my episode of watching the Rodney King video. You know, I was thinking about that when I saw the parallel between, although they didn't beat them, but drawing guns on babies. I mean, that was disturbing to me. Well, Nathaniel, um, hmm. you recall the incident in Buffalo, New York, where 35, 50 officers moved with people to push down this man that's about your age, I'm not there yet, but he was a senior citizen and they knocked him to the ground. I saw that. One officer was going to help and the other officer pushed him away and said no and they wanted to keep going. That's, it's, it's and then the next day or two, those officers all resigned because two officers were going to be disciplined for that, if I understand it correctly, the whole group of officers resigned from that particular unit as in protest. It's from the top, as we used to say about Darrell Gates here in LA, the culture starts from the top. It starts from the chief's mentality and what he accepts and what he condones and what he promotes. This racism, this racial profiling, it doesn't start down there necessarily with the line officers. It starts from the top. You got a president of the United States that believes in double down. And he lies today and tomorrow. He doesn't even address the lie he told today. He tells new lies tomorrow and he goes on like that every day. I was reading recently in the paper about that mentality he has of he wins each day. He doesn't care about yesterday or tomorrow. He does what he want to do today to win. And that's sort of the mentality of our law enforcement throughout this country, as Vanita and John have said. We got a problem of systemic racism existing throughout this country, and that culture is not going to change from one lawsuit or one incident. We have to, how do we do it? We just got to change over do an overall change on the police departments throughout this country because they are not afraid of the punishment for doing this they're not afraid of discipline for doing this it's almost a laughable thing to them from what i understand because they know that's, that nothing is going to happen to them and they double down on this racism y'all 
They're not stopping it because of George Floyd. So, and, and, and older men and, and younger people, like older men like you, you're going to be punished too. You're going to be harmed too. So we got to do something about this mentality throughout these law enforcement departments around the nation. Okay, uh, at this time, we'll go to the line and get a caller. Um, uh, there's one thing, though, I need to point out to our local audience here in Indianapolis. Uh, there was a video tape where a police officer attacked a female on Pennsylvania and Market Street here in Indianapolis, and we were all outraged about it. One of the officers was Officer Conrad Simpson, who, uh, which was fascinating. I just found that out. I was looking at the paper. That was very fascinating to me because that same officer ran over and killed uh, one of my clients two weeks, three weeks earlier on uh, Kentucky Avenue. And I was thinking, boy, this officer is going to cause the city a lot of money. And so it was amazing to me that he runs off the left side of the road and runs over and kills this young man who's walking along Kentucky Avenue. And then he attacks a woman on Market Street. This is uh, going to be an interesting case. Now, Imhotep, brother Imhotep, What's your thoughts for today, sir? Hello, uh, good morning to uh, all your great people out here. Nathaniel Lee and Mr. Grimes, I've been using you for quotes for the last week or so, and I don't think people are really understanding in this public where you're coming from, I beg them to listen, uh, because I was uh, chastised early in the week about uh, this new body camera uh, program we have in Indianapolis coming out. And I just said that, you know, we, we'd have to see because we've got plenty of times we've seen things on video and, and, and convictions are, are very, very, very low. Even charges are low. So, but I want to ask you guys, did you, you, are you familiar with what happened in, New Orleans, in uh, Louisiana this week with the, uh, the Louisiana uh, Supreme Court upholding the life sentence for the gentleman uh, uh, given the uh, three strikes rules for stealing the weed eater? The chief justice in Louisiana is, is a sister. I think her first name is Barbara Johnson, and she wrote a scathing, scathing dissent. She's the only black on the Louisiana Supreme Court. The other four people are white gentlemen. She wrote a scathing dissent, talking about uh, those three strikes rules and how they were based in uh, slave patrols and racism. She talked about how uh, this man's been locked up since 97 for a $35 crime, black man, for a $35 crime. They spent $582,000. If he stays his whole term, they will spend well over a million dollars for a thirty-five dollar crime. She called it uh, just reprehensible. What goes on down there? So my mother, being an attorney, I spoke with her about this issue the other day. She said that's the whole issue. It's the system itself, from the police all the way to the judges. And so maybe one of you all can speak to that, that in that courtroom. Hey, what was the name of the, 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 the What was the name of the case again? What was the name of the gentleman in the Louisiana case? It, it, what was his it, name? It, it, I can't think of the name of the case, but the guy serving life, it's been all over the news. He's serving a life sentence for stealing a $35 weed eater. He had two crimes before that. One was a $100 crime and one was like a $50 crime. So they gave him three strikes, uh, basically for less than $200. They gave him three strikes, and he's been in prison since 1997. 1997, it's, it's, it's the way. But the chief justice, I'm proud of her. She's the only, only black on the Supreme Court in Louisiana. And she wrote the most scathing uh, uh, indictment of this whole system uh, that America is, and I, I just, I just, it's just, it's just permeates throughout it. So, uh, if you all wouldn't uh, familiar with it, see it, please read up on that because uh, it, it, it permeates all the way to these judges, to these judges. And, and thanks, Mr. McCall. Okay. Uh... I, I, I didn't miss that story that he's talking about. Uh, it's uh, a gentleman named Fair Wayne Bryant, 62, was convicted in 1997 on one count of attempted simple burglary. Uh, his attorney, Peggy Sullivan, wrote that Bryant contended his life sentence is unconstitutionally harsh. So for stealing a head trimmer, he got a, a life sentence. And so his prior crimes was... Um, he had attempted forgery of a check of $150, 1989. Um, he uh, had uh, possession of stolen things. So he had some crimes that were insignificant 
they were still crimes, but we're talking about a thirty-five dollars head tremor that he got a life sentence for, which is curious. <clears throat> Extreme, no I think. crimes of violence in any of that. No crimes of violence. Well, he had one back in 1979. He had an attempted robbery, uh, but he didn't look like he got in time for that. And then 1987, possession of stolen items, and um, and then he had a bad check for 150 dollars in 1989. So he's got uh, three things. But in 1997, uh, it was hedge clippers, hedge clippers, which you know, like twenty or thirty dollars. Yeah. And um, let me let, let me jump in here. Uh, can I, uh, Nathaniel? Um, clearly, African Americans are disproportionately affected by the laws as they are in Louisiana. California, I think, have the first three strikes laws in the whole United States. And of course, African Americans were disproportionately affected. And it all goes back to the topic that we have been talking about for the last several weeks is systemic racism. What person in their right mind would want to steal a, 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 a weed? whacker or trimmer. What person would want to pass a bad check or in George, uh, uh, George Floyd's case of uh, a, uh, a phony $20 bill? What person would do that if they were raised in a society where their parents uh, could earn a living, uh, put food on the table, and they wouldn't have to hustle in the streets? And so, uh, and they went to a decent school and they were able to get an education and get a job. Well, that's all denied to African Americans. The poor guy in Louisiana, I don't know the whole case, but just from what you uh, uh, educated us on, Nathaniel, that's not the act of a, of a sane person. It's an act of a desperate person out there stealing and passing bad checks, trying to earn $20 here, $50 there. Uh, uh, it, it's, it all goes back to this uh, unjust society. And let me just say this, that we all talk about, and, and Attorney Banks was talking about a solution and, you know, what can we do, and, and, uh, and Attorney Grant talking about what, what can we do. Uh, the solution is this. It's, um, it has to come, we have to keep on pushing as African Americans. But the solution has to come from white Americans because they are not keeping in check the people who are perpetuating this system. They are remaining silent. Uh, 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 white people of today are saying, oh, uh, you know, the, the crimes of uh, my forefathers are past and done. I had nothing to do with that. You have everything to do with it because you're adopting the same system. Silence is violence. And, and uh, it's a vicious cycle. The, the caller talked about the Louisiana uh, 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 case, uh, but the root is the same. Those are the branches in the league. The root is the same. It's systemic racism. And the only way it's gonna change is if white people get on board and say, hey, enough is enough. And uh, uh, to their credit this time, uh, the protests over the uh, George Floyd killings have been different because they have been mostly white. So I see hope. I see hope. On these, on these th three strike laws, and Nathaniel, uh, you can attest as well in Indiana, I can say that so many of my classmates, children, and grandchildren have been locked up for decades as a result of these um, three strike laws. And, and I'm noting the three uh, charges, 1979, there's one in 1980 and one in 1997, if I heard uh, the facts um, correctly. Uh, again, I don't think I heard uh, violent crimes certainly the, the hedge trimmer and, and, and the second one that was mentioned. And they have had a enormously disproportionate impact on uh, African-Americans. And, and it's 
led to the mass incarceration and over-incarceration of uh, African-American males. And, you know, under the rubric of, you know, the war on crime or the war on drugs or uh, law and order. And I agree uh, wholeheartedly that we've got to get to uh, the root of uh, the issue. And yes, it is systemic racism. And yes, uh, it begins at the top and permeates uh, downward. I remember in uh, corporate America where there was an error where we said, we don't care what you think. We can't monitor or manage or regulate what you think. We can only address your behavior. And in this era, people feel very confident based on the tone set at the top to say exactly what it is and do what exactly they um, feel that they can do without any fear of accountability um, or penalty. And so we've got to keep having these conversations and these conversations, you're absolutely right, uh, Attorney Sweeney, have to be had with good white people, right? Um, Because, and then we talk about racism and what is racism and, you know, who can be racist. And I still prescribe to the belief that black people can't be inherently racist. we, we, We may have some views, but that in order to be racist, you have to have power over another people. And I'm sure that comment will spark a whole lot of um, opinion as well. Let me stop there. If I may say two things, I do believe though in the conversation between the good white folks, we as African Americans got to keep the pressure on and not go backwards to where we were prior to George Floyd. So I think it's in, it's, it's our duty to keep pressing pressing this society and especially this justice system with what we can to make them conscious and make them change. I uh, discussed the Washington State Justice Supreme Court uh, statement and and with the Washington attorney last week, this past week, and uh, as to whether or not the Supreme Court and the lower courts were doing anything to implement this recognition by them that there has been systemic racism throughout their system since the beginning. And he said, yes, in the state of Washington, they are overhauling their justice system criminally and civil because they had denied African-Americans certain rights and privileges in their civil courts and definitely in their criminal courts. And they are un- they're overturning some of the judgments and, and decisions that they have made in the past. So if we have this discussion further on any of your programs, I promise you I will contact that lawyer in Washington and some other people to get a list of what, they, what are they doing? Exactly what, are, what is the justice system doing to overturn some of their discriminating and racist decisions of the past? Because that I think is important for these courts to do. Well, I appreciate you getting that information because what we could do, we can start disseminating that to all the judges uh, across the country, particularly right. we start with our Judicial Fellows Program because we've been recruiting all the African-American judges all over the country to be part of this program. And so we could disseminate that to our list of judges we have as a point of beginning, maybe not a point of departure, but as a point of beginning to start the dialogue because we have a lot of judges that uh, we could send that information to because I think that um, most of these laws, a lot of people were talking about legislation and things like that, not realizing we got laws for everything, but we have these interpretations by judges. Right. So at the end of the day, uh, the laws are not sacrosanct. In other words, laws are merely mechanism. They're not the end result. Judges and jurors, ultimately judges make decisions as to what happened in these cases. 
it yes, was an African American judge in the fourth district who said enough is enough. They got to stop killing black men. They got to stop. Qualified immunity is not going to apply here. That had been granted. Same case, the Jones case out of the fourth district. So and we also had one with Judge Reed down in Mississippi. Similar type result in the last ten days. Judge Reed did a similar type. Uh, now it's going to be interesting when you see these cases. Uh, you know, qualified immunity. We have our own case that we're going. To, the Supreme Court, by the way, extended the time to file these briefs on all these cases until October the. The uh, third, I think. So there's no, you know, our brief was due on August 9th, but they said all cases are stayed. So they gave us some more time to look at every case in the country that had dealt with this issue. There were eight cases at the time. But okay, but back to this problem though. Uh, we see this occurring, and uh, Attorney Sweeney made some excellent point as to what needs to be done. But my concern is what can we do now to improve the plight of these folks immediately? What, if anything, do, can we do? Attorney Sweeney? Yeah, for, first of all, let me, uh, thank you. Uh, let me go back to, and then I'll answer your question, what can be done right now? Um, I was talking to my sister. I had a long conversation with her. She's a college president back east, the Northeast. And she was invited to be on a, huge uh, corporate board and uh, she was telling me about the uh, the luxuries and the uh, how that half live or not even half that one percent live you know flying around on corporate jets and things like that uh, simple truth is that white people have it easy most white people in this society. It was built for them by black folks and they don't want to give it up. That's the bottom line. They don't want to give up, up this, this system. And you know, the four of us uh, on, on this panel, we've lived great lives. We've traveled the world, live in beautiful homes and drive fancy cars and, and such. Uh, but the reality is that 95, 98% of African Americans don't live like us. Uh, and, and so the, the system, it's going to be difficult for white people to give up the power and the system they have. That's why they're clinging on to it so mightily. That's why after Obama, uh, with his great eight years that he had, showed that there is going to be a new America. That's why uh, uh, the, the man who's in the White House now was able to to sweep in and, and tap into people uh, who don't want to give up their system. So uh, uh, that, that is the fundamental fight that we have against changing the system. So answer your question, what can be done? I say that, uh, that economic empowerment of black people is the only solution. Uh, we as African Americans spend trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, uh, uh, it, it, probably in, in, you know consumer goods and services. I bet you 98% of that money that African Americans spend end up in the pocket of white corporations, which is white America. We have to empower ourselves, use our own products. We have, we are a very talented race, an extremely talented race. We should be buying our own records like Barry Gordon showed us uh, in the 50s and the 60s and it's been taken on to these new producers and, rec and African American record companies and you have, you know, billionaires uh, or almost billionaires like Dr. Dre. Uh, we should be Bouncing our own basketball, and, you know, instead of wearing the Nike sneakers, we should be wearing some African American sneakers. Although Jordan has Jordan brand, but that's still um, um, a Nike brand. You get they're peeling them off a piece, but but we should have our own economic base. Now I, I don't I don't advocate total separate separation, but if we have 
our own economic base and our own economic power, we don't need to depend on somebody else for a job. Uh, and we've been trying to do that for years. You know, then of course the Green, Greenwood riots, we, they burned down our, our, our institutions, our schools and things like that. But to answer your question, and I'll uh, uh, shut up right now, uh, it's gonna have to be black economic independence. Attorney Banks? I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, and I wanted to go back to those two opinions that um, you referenced, Attorney uh, Lee, and that Attorney Grimes referenced. I think that we should um, forward those opinions and see if we can't set up a conversation with two uh, organizations. The first is the National Conference of State Trial Judges. And then the second is the uh, National Center for State Courts. I think that a dialogue, they stand for justice in the um, trial uh, systems across our nation. And I think those are two uh, entities that we should move forward with having this conversation with Attorney uh, Grimes, Sweeney, and uh, Lee. I also agree wholeheartedly in the economic empower with the economic empowerment uh, conversation that um, attorney Sweeney is, is referencing. We may not have all the power that we want, but I believe we have all the power that we need to make a difference in uh, our uh, communities. Uh, and I agree with attorney Sweeney and it's been said that, you know, power doesn't exceed power, that power has to be, has to be taken. I believe that um, we move forward by and through a national recognition that African Americans enslaved that were brought over here to this nation uh, as enslaved uh, people and that they are entitled to first an apology for having to build this nation for free without compensation. You know, and people, you know, debate about that, but I have witnessed as an attorney that has handled hundreds of mediations that an apology can have tremendous power in beginning the healing process because as um, African Americans in this nation, uh, we carry a lot of pain and anguish. Can you imagine the six-year-old lying prone on her face on the ground in a parking lot. Um, just, just totally devastating. And so from 401 years to today, and we often hear people say, oh, get over it. Oh, we, did, we weren't involved, you know, in that. But it is the, the, the privilege that extends, you know, 401 years that demands that uh, white people take accountability for, as well, you know, for uh, their privilege and for what the, their forefathers' um, actions have led to today. And so I believe, and not within this administration, that under the next administration, that an apology be given to African Americans in this nation. And then we have a serious conversation, not a serious conversation, we need to pass a bill that, um, that um, a reparations bill. And what does reparations look like? You know, we talked about, you know, what does 40 acres and a mule look like today? It looks like equal access to education. We can send people to the moon, but we can't figure out how to ensure that every child in this nation have quality to access education. We need to ensure that, you know, all communities have access to broadband because as we know, so much education moving forward is going to be through the use of, of, of technology enabled through uh, the internet. Reparations looks like access to quality health care. Obamacare was a really great start. I agree with everything that 
Attorney Lee has said about pre-existing conditions, that's already included in the bill. That's not anything new. And we need to build on uh, those health uh, protections in the um, Affordable Care Act and uh, ensure that we begin to reduce those uh, health disparities. Uh, access to equal housing. You know, the whole housing system in the United States, again, built on a system that was intentionally built that way. Uh, when we look at, you know, redlining and the discriminatory, predatory, and lending practices that have existed for decades and have resulted in the decline in tax bases of our African American uh, communities and the over policing and uh, uh, no access to, you know, quality. Uh, public transportation systems and decline in schools. Um, these are things that should be addressed through a reparations bill that had been introduced every session of Congress for many, many years by Representative uh, Conyers and others, and we should move forward on this legislation now. Okay, now let's take a few callers before we get to turning around. Okay, now producer, let's take a few of these callers, then we'll come back. Okay, caller, you have a question for us today. Nathaniel, how are you today? Great. And your guest, I hope everybody's well. Thank you for saying so. Thank you. And, and, and just so you know, Nathaniel, you're talking to the world's second greatest Uber driver who ever gave you a ride. <laughs> Thank you. We got that out of the way. Uh, I'm wishing everybody well. Um, every now and then, um, I, I wonder how we get uh, to a place to where we believe that the white man is responsible for all our problems and we bear no responsibility for trying to do better. Uh, every now and then, that's how I think uh, it, it is put out there that uh, if the white man would just help us more, we would be okay. Uh, I'm listening to, I think it's three or four very powerful attorneys who are probably close to my age or in my age group. I'm 63 years old. I remember the first time I sat at a school with a white kid, probably around 1972 or so. Um, I started first grade, my cousin, my best friend, and myself. My best friend is now a millionaire. My cousin is now doing life. And I sit around every day working. Uh, one day, uh, 40 hours a week. And then when I get off, I put in another 30 hours a week making my own money. I don't believe or count on white people for anything. Uh, except, the, you know, for whatever it is, I got to count on them for. Part of the concern for me is prevention is worth a pound of cure. Prevent yourself from being bothered by the white man if you think that's the problem. Prevent yourself from being bothered by the police if you think that's the problem. I've said this to people before. I got pulled over by three white cops, a lady and two white guys. They thought I had been drinking, which I didn't. They called my wife and told my wife to come get me. This is at 38th and Emerson. It, 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 to me, it's hard to believe that all police are bad. 38th and Emerson, I, the police called my wife and told her to come get me and take me home. Hey, uh, and I, once again, I hate saying this, but the truth is the truth. I got pulled over with a dime bag of weed in my car. The <laughs> police officer made me tear the bag up told me I didn't want to ruin my life over a $10 bag of weed. This was a white guy, probably 35, 40 years old. Back in the, I would say it has to be in the 90s or so. But th this is how I've seen life. If given a choice now, I'd do everything I can to avoid the police. I grab my steering wheel if I get pulled over. Uh, I break out my, uh, my gun permit because that usually tells them I'm okay. I do everything I can to avoid being bothered by the police. 
Yeah, but I, the one yeah, thing you said, though, I think it's bad by telling you got a gun permit. I don't think you should do that. <laughs> you, know, you know, hey, we've had too many guys get shot. They got a gun. You better be careful about the gun permit. Uh, I'm telling you now, that's a bad yeah, idea. Like okay, said, go ahead. Both hands on the steering wheel. I got to pull out my license. I may as well pull out my gun permit. Don't pull out uh, the gun permit, man. I'm telling you. I have the gun with me. Let me say, can, can, way, I, and I do understand. But, but my deal, but my thought is, Let's let's behave in such a way we don't put ourselves in a position where they got to do something to us. Avoid them. I was at the, and, and this is the attitude. This is sort of an attitude I want to tell you about. I met the car wash yesterday. I go to drive my car. Beautiful young black woman. She's driving off her car. Her music's blaring. Be this. Be that. Hold this, be that, be, you, you know, I'm saying, why on earth are you as a black woman listening to what this man has to say about you? Well, it, I understand it. Now, let me have, uh, what, hold on one second, let me have John myself. respond because you raised a number of issues. Go ahead, Attorney Sweeney. Yes, uh, uh, first off, uh, no one is, uh, probably in our race, is solely blaming white people, uh, but, um, Historically, laws have been passed so that we don't have the best education, that is Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. Uh, racially restricted covenants so that we could not buy in a certain area homes were the law of the land until the 1950s. Um, it was basically an apartheid system. So, um, we have been discouraged every step of the way. Understand, I live in a white neighborhood now. Uh, uh, you know, my daughter was sent to uh, predominantly white schools. Uh, and, and, you know, and it doesn't make it right or anything, but, but I'm not blaming white people. I, I get my own, I do my own, uh, I, I earn my own money, I have, I have made it. Uh, uh, through a system in spite of racism. What I'm saying, what I want to make, the, the, the point I want to make to the caller is that it's so much more difficult when you're African-American and, you and there's a systemic racism problem in this country. It, you know, so, so that's the main problem. I mean, we're swimming upstream, whereas, you know, against the uh, current, whereas a a white person with the equal talent is swimming downstream. I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm not sorry. May I, may I say something, Nate, please? Um, yes, yeah, go ahead, sir. You know, sir, um, Attorney Banks spoke about the different laws involving housing. There's a book called Colors of Laws, or Color of Laws, correct me, Renita, on the uh, title, but it has all that history in there about how the government set up segregation in this country, how the government divided communities that were getting along and segregated them. But I do blame white people. Yeah, I do blame white people for the plight of black people here in this country today, uh, respectfully, sir. And I, I think it goes back to, I remember when Malcolm used to talk about, name another race in this country whose name has been taken away from them. The Chinese name has not been taken. The Latinos names have not been taken. We have the slave owner's name. Our African name is taken away. Our DNA for success. When you meet the average African, they are a proud, uh, aggressive, productive, successful person. They don't know anything about this racism we deal with here now on the whole. They didn't they don't have to, they didn't deal with the same thing we're dealing with over here because the white man beat the success DNA out of us. He took our name from us. He made us slaves and we're still coming out of that today. Yes, some of us got through the crack like Banks, Sweeney and Lee, but all of our people didn't come through or not enough of them to give us a successful foundation like they have. So I disagree with you, sir, respectfully about not blaming the white man for our plight today and for our people condition, because it has been a systemic system of racism that has kept us beat down. 
You look at the racist history in this country and see how you can come to a decision otherwise. And also, and call, -E look at the, the book, A Forgotten History of How Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein, R-O-T-H-S-T-E-I-N. And one other thing for, before you go on, Attorney Banks, something I need to tell Paul is very important. You said something that was very important to me. You work in a full-time job 40 hours a week, and then you work part-time job another 30 hours a week. Let me tell you what I've discovered. When I look at corporate America, and you name any corporation in the city, black folks are making far less than their white counterparts. I've sued everybody. I've subpoenaed records, and I don't want to name corporations, but the typical corporation pay African Americans about 60% of what the white counterparts are making for the same job. That's based on evidence I've collected. So if you're getting paid the same wages a lot of time as your white counterpart, you wouldn't be working two jobs. Just a quick point, but go ahead, Attorney Banks. I was just going to uh, harken back to W.E.B. Du Bois and his um, statement that the uh, problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, and that, in fact, is the problem of the 21st century. And I think, you know, when we have this conversation about um, – um, African American empowerment and you know allegations of you know using victimhood and quote playing race cards et cetera et cetera. It's because of our lack of knowledge regarding our history. If we would understand and know our history dating back to 401 uh, years ago through some of the books that have been uh, referenced. Uh, on this call, and, and many, many others, you know, as we know, our history wasn't taught and isn't taught today, you know, in our history books. So uh, oh. we don't know our history. We don't know our past. And what do they say? If you don't know your history, then how can you move forward, you know, into uh, the future? I mean, that's what Sankofa is all about, you know, looking backwards and in the present to understand how to move forward into uh, the future. And so uh, from uh, my perspective, you know, to those that talk about, you know, black victimhoods, I disagree wholeheartedly with that and believe that as we become more knowledgeable about our history, we'll understand that these institutions that uh, have been established were established and are operating even today as they were intended to operate and that they've had disproportionate uh, impact, negative impact on African-American success. And, and I would also agree that some of us have, despite those challenges gone on and uh, been very, very successful. But who knows? Uh, we might be sitting in the White House right now if the world okay, one other, you know, was. I, I hate to cut so everyone off. Stop there. We're out of time now. We're going to table this important discussion to next week because this is a really good topic we're talking about. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Real quickly, one of the hot topics we have to deal with next week is Conway, Kanye West is one of the big topics been floating that we have to discuss next week. We're going to talk about his run for presidency, and his stated purpose is to take votes away for Joe Biden, black votes away for Joe Biden to help Trump. So we'll talk about that also next week. So I'd like to thank this opportunity to thank all of our listening audience on all the social media platform. Make sure you share our story today, and we'll be back next week. We will continue this important discussion. Thank you. Stay safe, and may God bless and keep you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank uh, you, Attorney Lee.